Chapter 13. Welcome Back. Althur Mella, ex-extraordinary wizard, ghost, and mentor, was up in the pyramid library with Marcia. Althur's presence broke the convention that extraordinary wizard ghosts did not return to the wizard tower, but after her old tutor's shocking death, Marcia had missed Althur so much that when he was released from his year and a day in the place where he had entered ghosthood, Marcia had asked Althur to come back to the wizard tower and to use it just as he had when he was living. She had never regretted it. The tall purple-clad ghost with his white hair tied back in a ponytail was hovering over a large book with tissue-thin pages, wafting them over one by one. He was helping Marcia search for something, anything, that would explain the puddles. It was a thankless task. They had found nothing, but Marcia could not shake off the feeling that deep below the castle something was going on. It was even giving her nightmares. Fires burning out of control and monsters coming out of the deep regularly invaded her sleep. Marcia knew that everything relating to what lies beneath the castle was stored either in the manuscriptorium vaults or in the pyramid library. Beetle had done a complete search of that section in the vaults and found nothing more than his vent diagram so whatever information there was had to be in the pyramid library. What puzzled Marcia was that although she and Althor had found nothing positive, they had found some strange absences. In many of the shelf indexes there were unexplained gaps, even complete empty pages. The alchemy section was almost non-existent apart from some very basic student primers, and the notes relating the ice tunnels went back no further than when they were frozen after the great alchemy disaster, which was very odd, Althor said, because they were as old as the castle itself. It seemed to both Marcia and Althur that a large chunk of castle history had been systematically removed, and Marcia was beginning to suspect that the lack of information about the fire and the vents was linked. They must be, she thought, part of the same system, and was therefore removed at the same time. But why? The funny thing is, Marcia, Althur said, as he wafted through the pages of yet another index, you wouldn't know things were missing unless you were looking for them. Exactly, Marcia agreed, and if you didn't know about them to start with, you wouldn't be looking for them, would you? If you ask me, said Althur, someone has spent a long time up here, systematically removing anything relating to alchemy and ancient structures beneath the castle. It must have been an extraordinary wizard. No one else would have had the access. I wonder who it was. More to the point, I wonder why, said Marcia. She thumped a pile of pamphlets down, and a cloud of dust passed through Althur. The ghost sputtered. Careful, Marcia, I'm allergic to dust. Marcia laughed. You can't be, Althur. You are a ghost. Althur looked a little offended. It was not polite to remind a ghost of their ghosthood. Well, I am, he said huffily, ever since that ghastly Drago Mills place. It's not totally ghastly, said Marcia. I got a very nice rug from the sale. Oh, hello. The little door to the library had swung open, and Septimus and Jenna came in. "'How lovely to see you both,' said Marcia. She looked at her apprentice, who she had not seen for some weeks. "'Oh, Septimus, you look so pale!' Septimus fielded a barrage of questions about whether he was eating properly and did he ever get outside in the daylight, and then went to talk to Althur, leaving Jenna to ask Marcia's advice about the dragon boat. Ten minutes later, Septimus, Jenna, and Marcia were out in the corridor, waiting for the stairs to change direction. They were on slow-mo due to the arrival of the elderly parents of one of the wizards, and Marcia was polite enough to wait until they had got off. Septimus watched the silver treads rise sedately upward. The shafts of sunlight coming in through the azure-blue glass of the stairwell window threw lazy, glimmering patterns onto the solid silver treads. He loved this time of day in the wizard tower. There was something magical about the evening sun when it came in low through the windows. Septimus took a deep breath and breathed in the scent of magic, sweet with a hint of sandalwood. "'Have you seen him acting suspiciously?' Marcia said suddenly. "'Huh?' said Septimus, heady with the magic. "'Marcellus, have you noticed anything strange?' It was a difficult question for Septimus to answer. Many things that Marcellus did could be thought of as strange, especially by Marcia, but Septimus did not like to tell tales. "'No,' he said." The stairs changed direction, and Marcia hopped on. "'I'll look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow evening, Septimus.' She looked at her apprentice critically, as he stepped back to let Jenna get on before him. "'It's not good for you, being buried like a mole under the ground.' Marcia was beginning to disappear from view. Jenna jumped on after her, and made her way down a few steps until she was near enough to talk. 
It, it really is all right, then, she asked Marcia. The dragon house staying open? Fresh air and some sunshine, just what the dragon boat needs, Marcia said, and Septimus, too. The stairs were now approaching the fifteenth floor. Dandra Draw, the new sick bay wizard, head-hunted by Marcia for her skills in disenchantment, had just finished an emergency call-out to a wizard who had been convinced he had enchanted himself by reading an ancient text. Dandra had diagnosed papyrophobia and was now on her way up to see Marcia. She was waiting patiently for the stairs to change direction when she saw the distinctive purple pointy pythons appearing above her. "'Good afternoon, Madam Marcia," said the sick bay wizard. She waited politely for Marcia to rotate past. "'Jump on, Dandra,' said Marcia. "'I'm sure you've got better things to do than wait there.' Dandra Draw was new to the wizard tower and was unsure of protocol. She had recently arrived from the dry, hot countries in the south where she had lived in a beautiful star-encrusted circular tent beside a deep pool on the edge of a desert. Life there had been so much simpler. It had certainly not involved stairs of any description or extraordinary wizards with weird shoes. Dandra hesitated. Surely it was not right to stand above the extraordinary wizard, but it was impossible to step on below as those stairs had already passed. And, oh no, here came the princess, slowly revolving down. Dandra did a confused half-bow, half-curtsy. What was she to do now? Could she jump on in front of the princess? Oh, it was all too much. Get on, Dandra, do, said Marcia impatiently. Dandra took a deep breath and jumped nervously onto the empty stair between Marcia and Jenna. It was an embarrassing squash, and Dandra hardly dared breathe. She decided to deliver her message, whatever the protocol. Madam Marcia, what we hope for happen. Syra Sierra is awake. Marcia took a moment to digest Dandra's way of speaking, but Septimus understood at once. Syra's awake? he asked. You mean she is disenchanted? Dandra looked up to see the big brown boots of the extraordinary apprentice. Yes, she said. Syra is disenchanted. Dandra, that is marvelous news, said Marcia. I shall go and see her at once. So shall I, said Septimus. Marcia stepped off the stairs, closely followed by Dandra Draw, who performed an awkward jump, and to her embarrassment landed on Marcia's cloak hem. See you tomorrow, Sep, Jenna said, as she carried on down. See you, Jen, Septimus called, as he jumped onto the seventh floor. Jenna saw Marcia put her arm round Septimus's shoulders and lead him down the dimly lit corridor that led to the sick bay. She was glad to see Septimus back with Marcia in the wizard tower. It suited him better, and she had to admit it felt safer. Jenna pushed away a niggle of anxiety at the thought that he still had one more day to go in the great chamber of alchemy and physic. Septimus would soon be back, she told herself. Jenna jumped off the stairs in the great hall and wandered across to the tall silver doors, watching the flickering images on the walls which showed important and often dramatic moments in the history of the tower, fade in and out of focus. One that she had not seen before came into view, Septimus and Spitfire attacking the dark dragon. She smiled and wondered if Septimus had seen it yet. Jenna had an idea. She scribbled a welcome-back party invitation for Septimus and knocked on the door of the duty wizard's cupboard. Hildegard Pigeon peered around the door. Oh, she said, looking surprised and glancing back into the cupboard. "'Princess Jenna,' Hildegard said, oddly loudly. She peered out. "'How can I help you?' A muffled cough came from inside the cupboard. Jenna thought it sounded familiar, although she couldn't place it. "'Can you give this to Septimus, please?' she asked. Hildegard's hand shot out of the narrow gap between the door and the door jamb and hurriedly took the invitation. "'Um, thank you,' said Jenna. "'Sorry to interrupt whatever it is you're doing.' "'Doing?' Hildegard squeaked. "'I'm not doing anything!' The door to the duty wizard cupboard slammed shut. Jenna shook her head. Now that Hildegard was almost a proper wizard, she was as weird as the rest of them, she thought. Pleased to be leaving the magical mist that always hung around the great hall of the wizard tower, Jenna whispered the password and waited while the huge silver doors to the wizard tower swung open, and the floor bade her, Goodbye, princess. Have a nice day. Moments later, she was running down the white marble steps in the brilliant, breathtakingly cold winter sunshine, heading back to the dragon boat, which was, amazingly, alive.